notes as we possibly can. Um, obviously, with a social mix in there and the proper community services and facilities in there or whatever. Just the, the query I would have is if we if we got around to the position of doing that, for instance, if Waterford or Cork City or Limerick City was wanted to do 300, 400 houses or something, you obviously offer advice to the uh, local authorities and to the department and all that, but would you have any plans in place where you could say, for instance, you could build 200 houses here or 500 houses, not exactly down to the exact type of house or whatever, but what, what you would need to put in there to get the social mix that we need, to get the facilities in there, but that we could deliver big projects. In Limerick, for instance, we delivered projects before, huge projects, which didn't work. Obviously, the Myros area, the South Hill area, certainly didn't work, but we delivered other big projects which did work. Jamesborough, Kennedy Park, um, Balanty Bags, places in the city, they, they worked with because the facilities were in the schools and the services were put into those. So I just think that, I think it's a dangerous thing to go to say we can never build large uh, schemes, estates again. But uh, just so. Okay, yeah. there's two parts to that. I'm going to answer the first part and I'm going to ask our Chief Executive to answer the second. Um, what you said, and again we heard members say it this morning and in previous ones, we're all in agreement that there have been terrible mistakes made by bi building monocultures in the past where you have 500 that are all the same type of house. That hopefully nobody's hoping to ever go back to that again. The reality going into the future is it's even more complex because we have to have things that are mixtures of socials, mixtures of types, so we need big and small, mixtures of tenure, where 40% of them will probably be for rental, built to rent, and 60% to own. So building in the future is going to be a really complex new endeavour where people like local authorities may well be the conductor of the orchestra, bringing all these people together, but only building a proportion for themselves. Now, John O'Connor is going to speak in detail about the practicalities of that, but again, we're not in any disagreement about things you're saying, but it's how we do it. The details are very important. John. Yeah, just, you know, building a development like, like that, it is about... Uh, ensuring that there, there's a mix uh, with you know, different forms of, of housing and, and different tenure. Uh, I was involved uh, previously in, in terms of Fatima Mansions redevelopment. So where, where you get the right mix uh, of housing of different types, you can build on, on scale. And I think it is appropriate for uh, local authorities, other public sector bodies, to build on that scale you know, with a mix of housing for, for uh, people on social housing, people uh, private renting, uh, people purchasing housing. Uh, and affordable housing. So I think we, we can do it, uh, and it has been done before. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Coppinger. Um, yeah, thanks. Well, well, just on that point um, that Deputy Quinovan raised, uh, this seems to be coming a theme of the last couple of days, I think. If we're to continue to look at small-scale social housing projects, we're never going to deal with the housing crisis. And that has to be grasped and accepted by everybody here. The idea that you can build 10 houses here, 20 houses there, 30, we're not going to house 100,000 families. You can argue about the scale of the waiting list that the minister did today, but there's loads of people who aren't on the waiting list as well who'd like to get on the waiting list. There's, also, there's like bus workers in my own constituency whose income is too high. So let's just deal with 100,000 for now. Right, as being a representative figure. I just want to take up this demonisation of social housing. I'm not saying by you. It's a general theme, but it's come up now. I absolutely uh, agree. The, who said that we can't have decent communities that are you know, made up of a few hundred houses? Because it seems to be a, a demonisation of people. Uh, what we need to deal with is poverty. You know, the people have been made poorer in the last number of years by austerity, by lots of other things. Um, I was brought up in a housing estate of 500 houses, but everybody had a job, practically. You know, so it was different. So the way around this is either increase the eligibility for social housing and have a, a bigger mix of people, some who are working, which would give higher rents to the local authorities or the housing agencies, Allow, and I know a lot of people who would go for that, actually. Or else, I, another thing I think we do need to look at is affordable housing. The state has to, the, the private sector is not going to build affordable houses. So there's a lot of workers paying 14, 15, 2,000 euros rent a month who would happily take an affordable house. So I just think that this constant acceptance that we must only have small scale, we can't deal with the, with the problem if we do. Just... The can, we, can we take that question yeah. first, Deputy, because it's a very interesting one and, and uh, our Chief Executive would like to comment on it, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah Deputy, I, I'd agree with you. you know, we need to be 
Bill, there are large sites that are in public sector hands, you know, local authorities or, or, or others. And as an aside, yeah, the, the housing agents, we've mapped all the, the local authority housing lands uh, and, and lands that's uh, under land ag aggregation and, we, and it has been assessed by the local authorities. And what is striking about a lot of that land is some of its very large sites. Uh, and in order to use those sites, we have to build on, on, on scale. And you're right, we need to have uh, a, a mix uh, of housing f uh, for people of, of different in income uh, levels and affor affordable ha housing uh, you know, across the board. Uh, and, it, and we also do need to build on the small sites as well. But you know, from the land mapping that we've done, there's quite a number of large sites. Uh, and if we want to you know, meet the, the, you know, the major targets, we have to build on, the, on those and provide housing for a range of income uh, groups. So Could I just yeah. no, just, I, just I, I was going to, about the cost of a house. I think that this is something the committee uh, needs to kind of get answers on, um, and maybe you could send us. You yes. seem to be doing a lot of research. I um, just want to ask what percentage of the cost of a social home, which is averaged at 180,000, you know, obviously depends where it is, um, do you believe is made up of the different elements of finance stroke profit? labour and materials, land and risk, development contributions. Like, we need to try to get a breakdown of that and similarly with your average private home. Um, because would it not make more sense rather than, you know, building temporary houses, modular or rapid build, whatever they're called, which average at around 150,000, but much more than in Dublin, um, to reduce the cost of building? You know, rather than building these houses that will last for 60 years, which is not permanent. No. Um, so Clearly, we're going to be very boring as set of witnesses because we're going to end up agreeing with almost everything that's been said by every, every deputy. But uh, exactly as Deputy Coppinger has said, we're targeting costs. We're hoping by the time your committee has its work finished to be able to give you elemental ranges as to where all the different parts come from and perhaps talk about targets for where we need to move with each of those components. But it's only going to work if we have an integrated solution across a number of branches of government. Again, as the Minister said this morning, not all the levers are in uh, that particular Ministry's hand. And, and, and again, also, in terms of our to-do list, our 12 to-do list, we have given you a set of recommendations of things that you could legislate for, that you could regulate for, that you could encourage or budget or fund for to try to get there. But they are spread across a wide range uh, of, of departments, as are the consequences of getting it wrong, spread across the whole economy as well. Thank you, Mr. Skeen. Just one point, clarification. You mentioned that you know you hoped you could supply those figures by the end of the committee. If they could be supplied sooner, they yeah. would be of much more obviously, assistance obviously. Uh, as we yes. go through our deliberations. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Daly, can I just ask one more? Just can I come back to you because okay. I, have, I have others who are looking for an opportunity? Deputy Daly. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think one of the reasons why there probably isn't disagreement is, I mean, I was at the meeting in the Custom House, and for me, he kind of stole the show in that the idea of setting out the parameters in the manner in which you do um, actually really validates the reason for the housing agency in the first place. And I think it's, it's really strategically important the way we're looking at it, and we won't grapple with it unless we do that. So in that sense, I'm agreeing with Jean. <laughs> so, but um, no, look, just a couple of specific things on that. Um, the points about changing family size and the stock that's already there is something that obviously comes up a lot. Clearly, um, the demographics of the population and how we utilise not just empty stock, but stock that's occupied by exactly. ageing citizens. Exactly. And it's the point of the interconnection between them all. There are a lot of older citizens who would happily downsize. And in actual fact, if we were developing more communal older citizen accommodation, which was independent, but with a little bit of support, like uh, that sort of uh, group housing, I suppose, for older people. I mean, any of us would aspire to that, but it's not an Irish cultural thing. If we were to deliver that and do that, it would, to me, free up a whole lot of other stock that growing families could occupy. But if there are any initiatives or specific ideas that you would have uh, to deal with that and to encourage people out of, of accommodation that they are over accommodated in, to me, I think it would be completely wrong to look at big or small. That's a false debate. M much of the big developments have actually been the ones most riddled with the biggest uh, social problems that have knocked on. And it's, on the one hand, it is a question of a lack of social mix, but also size of scale uh, as well. 
Uh, and I do think there is a difference between cities and areas outside of cities in terms of what's possible. I mean, for example, and I don't know if you've done any work on it, small scale works very well in rural areas, and I'm a constituency that's in Dublin, but it has huge rural parts, but we'd have small pockets of land where traditionally people came together collectively we we'll call it a sort of a mini cooperative. In some instances, the council provided a site at a cheap basis and maybe five or ten families got together and built collectively. So they got the economies of scale more than they would if it was a one-off house, but they benefited from the land. That has to work, and it ties into the idea of small, because small is better. Have you, have you done much on that, and is there anything to be uh, explored on that? I think the local authorities would find it easier to deal with the big projects it's in some ways the lazy approach. I know there's an economy of scale, but it can bring a lot of problems if it's, if it's not done properly uh, either. So I, I think there are just some aspects of Okay. Three, three things. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for the kind words about the role of the agency. We've only been there since 2010, and we're trying to put ourselves in that central place so mm -hmm. you get one source of objective data that doesn't have skin in the game and one set of ideas. We've been, mm -hmm. with, with great gratitude to the department, we've been told to go off and be more independent, be more like the EPA, be more like Board Panola, tell us things that we need to hear, mm -hmm. even if we don't want to hear them, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, your, your question allows me to answer one particular question, which I, I neglected to follow through on with Deputy Wallace. When we say about scale, it's not necessarily about building 500 all in the same place. So, for instance, if we have to build, say, let's go back to Deputy Carpenter's figure of 100,000 units in the next 10 years. Imagine if we, as Ireland Inc., go to the market for 10 years' worth of roofing tiles, 10 years' worth of windows, 10 years' worth of doors, 10 years' worth of radiators, a range of them, so the architects who are designing 50 here, five even, as you, as you pointed out, Deputy, and they're available to be used by people who we, Ireland Inc., have bought at scale to use procurement as being a weapon in our favour instead of a scourge on our back. That's one of the ways that I mean that scale could operate. And it's certainly, going back to Deputy Wallace's point, recognises the fact that very often our need, especially outside Dublin, because we have to remember that we have a whole country to deal with here, uh, will often be met in units of 3 and 5 and 35. And then also, to go back to your, question, to your, your point, Deputy Daly, uh, of the fact that we have, for instance, not just vacant houses, but underutilised houses, we have 1,500 small towns and villages in Ireland, all over Ireland. If we targeted, if we challenged each of those to bring forward four new houses, four new houses every year. That's 3,000, uh, 6,000 a year from those sources alone, which both, as John says, brought those villages back to life, but also allows us to reach those targets, those very uh, onerous targets of the numbers very, very quickly while spreading the benefit out and using the installed uh, houses and the streets and the sewers and the pubs and the shops that surround them. And we achieve many goals all at the same time. But all that comes, here, look, from us regarding housing, not as a building housing exercise but from a managing our housing stock, part of which is building, part of which is renewing and part of which is bringing back into use. And then I think the, was there a last point there? Oh yes, about the ageing. Um, John will talk about this, which is that uh, you're absolutely right that, that trying to free up existing stock, we have to learn from the lessons of our nearby neighbour in Britain and see the disaster that was the poll tax, the disaster that was trying to uh, get older people to leave their homes. Sticks don't work. We've got to use honey and carrots to get people out and to give them something that's so attractive, exactly as you say, said, uh, Deputy, that they would want to leave that house to go something better in the same area with the same parish priest and the same uh, pharmacy that they've been used to. That's the way forward. That's the way forward, to increase the yield out of what we have. But again, it's that word managing, Deputy. It's about managing as much as building that we're advising. Uh, Mr Skeen, just on one point that Deputy Daly was talking about, you know, the, the age profile and so forth. We had the Minister in this morning, and he was talking, he referred to housing construction as a pipeline and it was being ramped up and there will, over the number of years, and whether you agree with the programme or not, it, I just want to park it, but it, it's to grow. In terms of the mix of housing, have you fed into that? In other words, the, the, the model and the proportion of houses that would be one, two and three bed, are they based on your figures? There's two answers to that. The first is, uh, in addition to being one of our directors, uh, David Silk is our director of research. We have two papers out so far, two publications and a third on the way. Would you like to describe what they are? You know, uh, last year we produced a statement of housing supply and demand and it looked at um, what we produced last year and what we needed to produce, and then looking forward into 2017, what kind of accommodation will be required, uh, and sort of the general trends around that. Uh, so I can provide that to the committee, and we're updating that for this year now. But is that feeding specifically into the department of the minister's yes. housing yes. construction? Yes. Pro 
Uh, yes, yes, it is. One thing I, I will say in ter terms of, we talk about you know, different household size, it doesn't mean you know, a one-person household, maybe the appropriate accommodation you know, is a two-bedroom house or two-bedroom apartment because someone wants you know, you know, flexibility for visitors and that. So we're not saying it's one person, you know, yeah. you know, one, one bedroom. But no, we, we, ha we are feeding that in, yeah. in terms of, of we, we need We work very closely with the department, so we, we're their go-to people for the data. And sometimes we'll commission that outwards beyond ourselves. But we're trying to grow into that position. As I say, it's early days of the agency, only around 2010. We're trying to grow into becoming a, a reliable source for yourselves as well, for policymakers as much as for the department, as to facts that can be trusted uh, going forward and that they haven't been given to you by an auctioneer or a builder. With no disrespect to them, but they have their own, they have their own uh, agenda to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman, I'm sorry for being absent for a few minutes there. Uh, on the concept of, of large uh, scale, uh, three, four hundred houses to resolve the problem, I, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Uh, I think that uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you compare the, the situation that we've had at present in various local authority areas or in the, throughout, throughout the country, and you have an over concentration of numbers, uh, in 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 in, in a, what would be termed a socially deprived area, it doesn't make for it might make for good economics, but it certainly doesn't make for good uh, uh, coexistence and, and and social and 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 social peace. And we all know and deal with on a fairly regular basis the issues that arise there. And one of the problems and contributory factors to my from my point of view has been that since the local authorities slowed down or stopped altogether in direct build. Uh, there seems to be a concentration of uh, people who have, would fit into that category with the local authorities and the rest of the, of, of the people being catered for by the voluntary housing agencies. Uh, and uh, the suggestion has been made by local authority members that uh, cherry picking takes place and that, uh, that you have a, an over concentration of, of uh, social deprivation in one area, it is lethal. The fact of the matter is, Chairman, it doesn't work, and I would strongly advise against it. I think that the, the, the ideal situation is somewhere in the region of 40, 40 houses to, 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 to make an input. The economies of scale, you can get it the same way, Chairman, uh, as, as you've just said. Uh, you, can, you can buy in bulk or order in bulk over a period of time. There were a number of builders in this country who specialised in building in several locations throughout the country at the same time using the same model, using the same dimensions in terms of roof trusses and everything, and they, 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 they were for many years at that and were very successful and, and built very good houses. And the same can be done, but the, the point I, want, I want, to, want to make, and this is, this is the quality, the quality as well, for instance duplex, duplex houses, duplex houses and the design of the house is something you should be very, very careful of. For example, where you go travel up on an outside, an external stairway, sometimes an older person who gets blown off the, 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 the stairway at, in, in a gale, or a child, or a small child who gets blown off. And we've all seen examples of this, where ice in wintertime or whatever causes people to slip. But the worst part of it all is, is where under the stairs there's an entrance to somebody else's house. And that's very, very classical case of maximisation in terms of availing of the economics of it. But it's not good living conditions. It's not a good place to put people. And we shouldn't ever try to do that because we're, we're penalising them. We're impacting the, on them in a way that makes it impossible for them to live and to exist and to have a reasonable quality of life. So I would strongly urge that we don't go down that road, Chairman. I, I think that we have to build the numbers. But the, the, the economies of scale can be achieved in the way that, that, that Mr. Skin has, has mentioned. But by all, I, I, I would strongly advise that we avoid uh, uh, creation of ghettos, because if you multiply the numbers to the extent uh, that, 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 that might, be, uh, might be a tendency for people to respond quickly to a situation, we make a worse situation. Social housing is a ghetto in every location. Yeah, that's, I was going know, to well, that's not. That's, that's not, what that's you're no, suggesting. No, I have not. I'm sorry, Chairman. That is, that is a rubbish suggestion. I said nothing of the sort. You said 40, I said nothing 40. of the sort. I said nothing of the sort to the chair, and you know I didn't say it either. I, I, want, to, I want to say this. I want to emphasise. I said over concentration of the kind of development that I spoke about 
is not a good, a good way to resolve the problem and will result in ghettoisation. And we don't want that. And we've seen that before. Please, for one I'm trying to twist Deputy, it for politically Deputy, properties. Deputy, 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 I fully realise what you're saying. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I fully realise what you're trying to say. I'm not shouting. I'm not shouting. But I didn't interrupt you. And you interrupted me. I'm sorry, Chairman. Thank you. Look. <clears throat> the purpose of having the witnesses here, this isn't to make statements. We will have our own debate afterwards on the evidence that has been produced. We have witnesses here, and the purpose of the session is to question them, interrogate them, and to extract the information that we want. At subsequent meetings, we will then try and decide what policy responses, what recommendations, and so forth. But the purpose of today's session is we have witnesses who have made a presentation and that we're to uh, question them. Deputy Durkin, you made a number of statements there, which I'm now going to afford the witnesses Correct. the opportunity to Correct. respond to. And after that, it's Deputy Function. Thank you. The, the, uh, the issues that are being raised by Deputy Durkin, which refer back to the issues uh, raised uh, by Dep Deputy Coppinger, get to the heart of it. So it's well worthwhile debating these in exactly the manner you're doing. There uh, is not necessarily a contradiction between the two positions. So um, Deputy Coppinger is absolutely correct that our vision of social housing as being solely being something for poor people, if I'm, if I'm not misquoting you uh, incorrectly, that's what we have to move away from. We've got to start to understand that exactly as we said, and our publications have said, a third of our population will need some form of support, and the support will be graduated. And the wonderful thing about something like the housing assistance payment, it now allows people like the bus driver mentioned by Deputy Coppinger, to live in a place, and perhaps the trainee guard, the young nurse. There's a whole range of people who are in full employment who need to have some form of support. That's the first issue. The second issue is that the types of mixtures that we're talking about, and Deputy Durkin is dead right to haul me up on it, if I gave an, a mistaken impression that I'm talking about building slabs of 500 semi-D houses for uh, local authority consumption. You're absolutely right. There's no, there's no future in that. But what there is a future for is developments, say 500 at a time, of which 50 are for local authority, of which 50 are for housing for age, of which 50 are posh off, you know, very expensive housing, but that it's all going ahead at the same time. That's what we're trying to give the, 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 the idea for. So the points you're making, Deputy, are absolutely correct, that we have to learn from them. And we're going to have to have standards that are going to leave things like duplexes in the past, completely new types of mixes, because again, as we're saying to, to the committee, there will be mixtures of type, small, medium and large, and of tenure, owned, owned by the state, owned by AHBs, and owned privately, all mixed up together. And it's a completely different type of project we haven't even really started to do. And the last thing, so as not to take up too much time here, look, is we do have them among us. So we can go down to places like Cherrywood, which is already underway now, where we have exactly those types of mixes. But the advantage of going ahead in a big unit is we get fantastic social facilities, we get fantastic parks, we get wonderful roads, we get very, very good public transportation systems, which are made possible by having that overview all at the same time. So when it's done right, and thanks be to God, we are finally doing it right, in Ireland, uh, it does work and everybody benefits. It really is a win-win. It can be built into uh, what we call strategic development zones. Is that an ideal opportunity for it? It is certainly becoming a vehicle for delivering it, but our local authorities have local area plans and master plans, which are a sort of a step-down version of it, which can be very, very good when skillfully used uh, and not as time-consuming as the S STZs. Thank you. Deputy Function. Chair, first of all, thanks very much for the presentation. I think your document is, is very good and very concise. Um, I just have a few questions in relation to mortgage to rent. I, I raised this on, on Tuesday. Um, from a lot of my dealings with it are people that are trying to go through mortgage to rent. It's, it, there's huge difficulties around red tape, paperwork, and people being told your your sort of oh, your house is too big. It could, it could be a couple that their family has grown up and moved on. It's a three bed house. Where they've been told, look, you can't you can't qualify for the scheme because of that, which it makes absolutely no sense. I just was wondering what your opinions were on that, because I think a lot of people that could be qualifying for that are falling through the cracks because of really stupid things like that. Telling somebody that I mean, it's not like they're living in a mansion, you know. Um, the other thing in your document, the the recommendation of state support to households um, who don't qualify for, for social housing support. I think that's a good idea, but I do think as well we need to make sure that what we need to be doing is challenging the banks in relation to people with mortgage difficulties and ensuring that they are negotiating with them and sitting down with them because 
you know, a lot of the problem sometimes is the banks won't talk to people. I deal with people on a regular basis that are willing to pay, and, and in a lot of cases, a considerable amount of the mortgage, but the banks just, you know, so I think it's a good suggestion, but I think we need to be careful that we're not sort of letting the banks off the hook in that regard. But I do think um, that, that mortgage rent needs to be looked at because an awful lot of people that are coming onto the housing list now are coming on because of repossessions, and it is obviously you know, increasing the whole issue around homelessness and everything. Okay. Um, Deputy, thank you very much for bringing up that issue because it's, it's an opportunity that we passionately want to be able to talk yeah. about because the agency are saying, above all else, before we clear vacancies, before we do things to do with building, will we, for God's sake, stop anybody else ending up in the circumstance? So the prevention of people ending up in these circumstances must be everybody's highest uh, role. And again, this goes back to the need for us to regard housing as something that needs management as well as building. So John, our CEO, will love and he'll speak for half an hour, if you like, about the importance <laughs> of this issue. We only have a couple of moments, but it's it's critically yeah. important. So thank you for bringing it up, John. Yeah, no. In terms of yeah, taking it at, at the bigger picture level, in terms of the number of households in you know mortgage arrears is a real you know mm. we, we all know and you, you know it better. You're on the on the ground more than us in terms of how serious an issue it, it is. Uh, and our you know biggest concern about it, there's a financial issue, but it's been going on for so long. You know, in terms of the psychological effects, you know, on, on families, yeah. you know, is incredibly ser serious, and no, you know, dealing with uh, fam families. So we absolutely must address it, uh, and the better be careful about, you know, s saying about in terms of central bank and Department of Finance. We'll be focusing it from the bank's point of view, but you know, urge the committee to look at it from the people's point of view, view the, you know, the, um, uh, the families uh, and house, house, households. Um, the, and there's very, you know, seri you know, very serious arrear levels of arrears. Um, there's arrears, and then there's restructuring, and a lot of restructuring isn't, you know, in, in our view, is, isn't sustainable. To come to the mortgage to rent, um, yeah, it hasn't been affected to, to date. You know, let's be, be, be honest in terms of between private mortgage to rent and local authority mortgage to rent, we only have 357. Uh, households, although it's important that those house, households have been helped, there may be another uh, number of hundred uh, coming through that will avail of it. So we have to make that mortgage to rent uh, work uh, better and, and much more effectively. And the issues that you raised about uh, maybe too many constraints in terms of how many bedrooms have you have you got, where is your house lo located? Um, I think we over uh, we can we need to overcome them. We have been in a lot of discussions. Uh, the process at the moment requires an approved housing body to purchase the property, uh, and maybe in the whole process, you know, just takes too long. Uh, so we have ideas in terms of how it could be improved, but it has, to, it must be improved uh, because there's a lot of families that should be able to avail of, of, of mortgage to rent. Are your yeah. ideas in this document or? In relation yeah, to how to improve they're it. They're outlined, but we can provide more. Yeah, that'd be great. I think yes. we'd say yeah. the committee is, you know, we think it's a project, a, an endeavour that definitely has problems, but, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, Let's no, go it, back and yeah, turn the could, things that have worked out yeah. wrong to lessons, yeah, yeah, and see if we make it work better. Sp specific, uh, Mr. Skehan. That's two areas of information that you might. One is on the vacant, the vacancies, uh, vacancies the costs, and, and the mortgage to rent. Mortgage specifically, in specific new ideas. Yep. Yeah. Please. Yes. Are you Def, thank you very much. Yeah. And just, and just two, two other issues. Yeah. On, on this, the state support. Um, one of the issues, maybe I think you know, the committee should look at, look at. At the moment, um, you either get full, you know, support. You know, in terms of um, social housing or other forms of, of uh, housing support, uh, or, or you get nothing. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of, of, of families that are can't get the support, uh, but can't afford to rent or buy on, on the market. And so we need to uh, provide a lot of support for new for new families, but also families that are that are in in, in their in their homes at the moment. We have to find ways of supporting them. And th this, is a bullet, this is a bullet that's got to be grasped by the incoming government. The arrears are going to peak, so to speak, and uh, the numbers are enormous, and they will dwarf all the other stuff we're talking about here, about emergency accommodation and things like that. It's uncomfortable. Bullets will have to be bitten, whatever cliches you want to use, but we'd urge the committee to draw the government's highest priority towards addressing this issue. It's not going to go away, and as we get closer and closer to a period where negative equity goes away, uh, we're going to see the temptation for banks to 
to crystallise or to, to realise their assets, and uh, we've got to act urgently. And your committee has got to use its voice to make this uh, known to government. It's an urgent, urgent issue. Thank you, Deputy Ryan. Yeah, just uh, my main question was to rent. But look, uh, another issue in relation to land ownership. Um, where, where lands uh, previously in the ownership of local authorities have been transferred to yourselves as a means of perhaps in the past getting them off the local authorities books uh, what's the process of, of getting those lands back into play are, are all those lands that you currently have in that context in play at the moment because we would have kind of seen we, we could ask a local authority what lands he own and they probably wouldn't include the lands they've transferred to yourself so can you give us an explanation of that yeah a Annie this is land that was transferred into the land aggregation scheme and um, in name you know the housing agency is the owner of them uh, the first thing if a, a local authority wants that land to utilize uh, it'll be transferred back to them. You know, there's no, there's no question about that. So if a simple, the, a simple, simple process, simple, simple process, um, and there's no que question. The main thing from our point of view is that provided the local authority is actually going to utilise the land and, pro and provide provide ha housing, um, the and we are working. Um, a number of the sites are in the process, you know, of going through in different ways back to local authorities to utilise for housing, uh, and. Then we're working in partnership with some local authorities to uh, go out with sites, you know, to develop. You know, for example, there's one in Dunleary, uh, right down, which we want to get, get built, you know, as, as quickly as possible. But there's other, other lands right around the country. But the, the local authorities, get, you know, if, if they want to build housing, the land will be transferred back. Okay. Thank you, uh, Deputy Butler. Um, I would also like to thank you for the presentation. It's very informative. And my question is around the 200,000 homes that lie vacant throughout the country. Would you have taken into account the amount of, um, you know, you take shops in different uh, town cities and villages and there's overhead accommodation in a lot of these that is underutilised. Um, and a, a lot of it is derelict, actually, you know, and, and, and mightn't have the proper um, wiring and heating, etc. When you were when you were including, uh, you know, you had a figure of two hundred thousand. Were, the, were these areas included in that, or do you see a merit in a scheme be put forward for the rejuvenisation of, you know, the, the, these overheads? If, if you get my point. Yeah. yeah. Um, th those figures are taken from the last census, so right. there would have been. And the census of renewators who would have uh, identified the properties as vacant and in doing so they would have called to all the properties and asked mm -hmm. if there was somebody living upstairs over a shop and for mm -hmm. example uh, just to clarify your earlier question um, it does exclude the holiday homes there's about I think it's uh, 60,000 holiday homes in addition to the 200,000 vacant properties the census, the current census, when does that feed into, what's the time lag, I suppose? I, I understand that there's a, a priority being given to looking at the vacant properties, so I think that's going to be one of the issues that the CSO have prioritised. Back Butler, in there, yes. Do you see a merit in, you know that there, there is a huge amount, especially in probably in more rural areas, but in cities as well, there's an awful lot of... Um, two three-storey buildings that's the, so in the bottom section has been used and, and the and the upstairs are are not yes and you know wouldn't, wouldn't that be a, a part solution to to the, yes. the problem at the moment yes yes i mean the agency always emphasizes the efficient use of the housing stock you know as as a key um thing that we need to prioritize and, okay. and that is prioritizing what is already available yeah Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah de definitely. Uh, one thing that we'd be extremely keen on in terms of towns and villages, um, because it's very manageable in terms yes. of, of, of kind of the, the, the scale that we need to get those properties you know, back into use, get those houses back, back into use. Yeah, the housing agency would be uh, very supportive and, and would assist any local authority that, that wanted uh, to do that. And you know, maybe the, the committee should look at how we incentivise uh, not only for the housing that's needed, but also to re re revitalise uh, the villages, because with, with again the, the small, the falling household size, it's nearly <coughs> more important actually that people actually move back uh, into the villages. So, so we think that's and, and it's, it's 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 very manageable. We think it's, it's a very manageable thing to, to do. Um, on the vacancies, uh, the other thing, yeah, we in addition to the you know the figures coming from the CSO, so what other countries have done 
uh, in relation to vacant properties is they, you know, with the local authorities and maybe with the support of an agency like ourselves, they go about identifying all the properties uh, and identifying the reasons why they're vacant. You know, so of the vacant properties, there's some that might not be available uh, because some, somebody owns it and, and doesn't wish to, to, to sell. But there's a lot of, of properties vacant for various reasons and you'd be surprised uh, how many uh, you can get back into, into use. Uh, in England, you know, very specifically, they have been addressing this you know, for, for years because maybe they don't build enough ha housing. And their houses, the amount of houses in the whole of England that uh, are vacant for more than six months is 200,000. They have a, a housing stock, you know, a national housing stock of 23,500 homes, yeah. and they've got 200,000 of those. So, but they have been very actively, um, you know, uh, surveying them and identifying all the different issues about why they're, why, why they're vacant. And we have got ideas in terms of, of how they, uh, it can be used. Before I conclude, I want to be specific on this because you've already en engaged in terms of you're going to send us information. Yes. Um, in terms of the breakdown of the, those 200,000. But I think the committee would also be interested to hear best practice that you've seen internationally, how they've managed to only have 200,000, and any practical suggestions um, might accompany those figures. Obviously, uh, some of them for, might be semi-derelict, but how, in other words, what this committee could do to recommend that would fast track the reintroduction of some of those into family homes. So you might include that in, in your... And could I just say one thing... I was going to say, you yeah. can have the floor to... Just, just to finish up that. Yes. And that. Okay, well, then we're leaving you with, with a very simple thought over and over again, over and over again, that the big picture is managing all of our housing, of which a part is building. I'm sorry, I've said it five times now, but, but we've got to stop ourselves being sucked into the builder's agenda that the only solution to everything is building. It's not. It's managing our stocks in a smarter way. That's the first thing. And managing doesn't just mean providing them, but it also means controlling the price. We've got to, as a nation, set targets for ourselves as to what constitutes an affordable house, which is a reasonable multiplier of the disposable income of households. And we must bring about a situation where our development sector build to price. They build to price and not have all of us scrabbling around trying to bring whatever money we have up to them to whatever prices they set for us. We've got to drive that down. And that needs a concerted effort across all the instruments of government to bring that about. That's the challenge, if I may say so, for your committee, is to see what we can do working with you, and we're your servants uh, from here to the end of July to help you do that, but that's the big picture if we can do that. Um, Mr Silk, Mr Skehan, Mr O'Connor, thank you very much for your attendance this afternoon. Um, the, I suppose the direct and frank answers and the supporting documentation that you gave, the, fact, the, the statistics you provided are very useful. I'm proposing that we suspend for a couple of minutes so as the next uh, witnesses can take their seats. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome the Irish Council for Social Housing, represented this afternoon by Mr uh, Justin O'Brien, um, President of the Irish Council for Social Housing, Dr Donald McManus, the CEO, and Ms. Ms. Uh, Karen Gallagher, the Joint Project Director of Policy. Um, you have made a submission. Uh, I presume most of us have it. So, um, Mr. McManus, if you'd like to make an opening, or, or Mr. O'Brien, sorry, if you'd like to make an opening well, statement indeed, in yeah. relation to the submission okay. you thank presented. You. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and all members of the Oireachtas here for the opportunity to present on behalf of the Irish Council for Social Housing. We welcome this opportunity. Um, as you've introduced my colleagues, Donald and uh, Karen. Just to put in context, the Irish Council for Social Housing is the National Federation of Approved Housing Bodies in the country. We have 270 members who are spread throughout the country and we provide over 30,000 over 30, homes and related sports in about 500 different communities in the country, in both urban and rural areas. We are also provide, we provide a range of housing, what's termed general needs to what would be considered um, specialist needs which would be for the elderly, for the homeless, for people with learning disabilities and so on. I'd also put this in context that we, we have grown over the last 20 years with, this, with the aid of government's funding. We are actively engaged as one of, the, one of the pillars of the Social Housing Strategy 2020 and we try to work with the department and with other bodies to ensure that's implemented. 
In terms of homelessness, we're actively engaged with the Dublin Homeless uh, Regional Executive in terms of participation on the Consultative Forum and in the Implementation and Advisory Group, which is trying to inform and advise on responses to homelessness that are occurring in the city currently. Um, just as a point of reference, and I think the context of where we are now and where we were needs to be kind of reference. In 2009, the approved housing sector produced over 2,000 new family, new types of homes of social housing nationally, right? Uh, that was in the context where about 400 million was made available for the sector around 2008. In 2013, that funding had been reduced to about 40 million. So we've had to operate in very, very constrained context over the last number of years. I could say as well that capital funding spend was about 1,400 million for social housing in 2008. In 2014, it was reduced down to about 270 million. Um, so there has been a significant change for us in terms of adjusting to a, a very changed financial context for ourselves. Up to about 2011, 2010, we were always reliant on 100% capital funding from the state to acquire or to design and build. Since then, we've had to engage in different types of businesses and gear up for it in terms of engaging with private sectors, developers, financiers, receivers, NAMA, to enable the provision of new types, new types of, units of housing. Uh, and the sector has delivered nearly 2,000 NAMA controlled units in the last number of in the last number of year, units via leasing options or via acquisition and fitting out of distressed assets. Um, so we've had to get engaged. It's also true to say that, the fund, as I said, alluded to, the funding context we operated in previously is a 100% grant regime. It's now fundamentally altered uh, to a regime where there's a maximum of 30% CAF funding from the state and the rest we have to borrow from the Housing Finance Agency or from banks in terms of, of, of finding the rest of the funds to enable the acquisition and design and build. So we're into a very, very different mo business model of, of development. And that's something that's happened. And the context of this is not that we're afraid of this. It's a huge change for us. Uh, the context really is that in similar North European countries as Holland and Britain and Germany and France, that transition from 100% capital funding to primarily private funding has happened over a 10, 20 year period. We're being expected to adjust to this in about a five year time frame. So that's the context in which we're currently grappling with. Another context is that around 9% of social housing, 9% uh, of the housing stock in Ireland is social housing. We consider that far too small. And uh, this has been commented on by NESC in different reports over the years. Uh, and, and they have recommended there should be about 200,000 social housing units available in the country to meet social housing need. And we would, we, would rec we would endorse that, and we believe that social housing should be about 17% of, of housing provision nationally in the country. It will obviously vary from region and area to area in terms of social housing need. I think as well NESC of references is that in their recent reports, they're saying that one third of people in need of housing in this country will be unable to afford from their own resources. Most people aspire to a home ownership. The reality is, and, and provision is, there's a discordance between the affordability of home ownership for people as per the aspiration of it. And that's where social housing is a central platform and a very important one. Our fundamental message is it needs to be increased, right? And in that context as well, we would support or it's one of the policy options in the social housing strategy 2020, which we're linked to it, that there should be development of the affordable or cost rental housing model. We believe that would meet the needs of people who are say, starting off teachers, nurses who are on lowish incomes, can't get a mortgage. We'd support that type of provision where they'd be able to rent at a reduced market rent and lived in mixed tenure schemes of social and affordable. And that's something we'll see as being very, very important for the way ahead. One thing, and just a note, is that, you know, rent supplement, I mean, in terms of homelessness and the addressing of homelessness, just to say that, obviously, the, main, the maintenance of adequate rent allowance for people is critical, right? It's the main driver of people becoming homeless in the Dublin area because of the unaffordability factor. I'd also add that in terms of, say, the housing assistance payment, which is a key strategy of the social housing strategy, one, it's not going to be cost neutral, two, it it needs to be aligned with market rent, and thirdly, there needs to be security of tenure for people if in that option. It's point, I mean, you can see from the homeless figures where people, the families who are presenting have mainly come because of lack of affordability. So it's a key element of consideration for the future. As well, we are trying to, you know, as I said, we, we 
we provide high levels of housing support where, where mainstream housing providers in the same are dedicated purpose to providing housing. So we believe that we do it reasonably well. We're having to grapple with a more complex environment of operation in terms of regulation, in terms of funding and finance. Uh, some of the developments we've tried to undertake in the last number of years, to ha and particularly with some of the NAMA schemes, have been stymied with planning issues, technical issues, financial issues. They are, the, they are not the impediments, they are the issues that we have to deal with in terms of getting developments across the line. I should say as well, and it's an important one, is that in 2015, the sector has provided about 1,300 new units of accommodation via acquisitions and via uh, design and build and so on. So it's not often recognised publicly that we've reached that level of new provision, but I think it's important to say that we've been trying to rise to the challenge of delivery and we, still wa and we want to enhance that for ourselves. And our paper, in fact, represents some of the issues that we think uh, could make that more easier for us. One of the key issues, and it's referenced clearly in the submission we made, is about the assembly of suitable sites for housing. There was previously a low-cost subsidised sites programme administered by local authorities in the 1980s and 90s. That was absolutely beneficial to the sector, uh, becoming established, becoming having an economy of scale and, and a stability. So it's very, very critical. Also, we want to engage with the Part 5 provision, and we've alluded to that in, in, our, in our submission in terms that it should be 20% rather than 10%. We feel that would be enhancing and good value for money. I mean, an important point of consideration in our submission, and in 2005 there was, when the Celtic Tiger was in its boom with houses, that uh, land costs were, on some schemes, totalling up about 40% of the costs. Now, we just feel that's untenable. We've made recommendations about sites being made available. We'd also reference back to and state lands that are unused being made available for the sector. We think that's very, very critical. We'd also reference back to the Judge Kenny report back in 1973 about the land value. And in fact, the Dáil Committee 20 years ago considered that, said it wasn't unconstitutional and it should be implemented. So it's partly back to the Dáil to, or the department or the minister to, to endorse that. Um, we're, as I say, we, this housing, we're, as housing associations, we, as I say, we're very much changed from what we were 10 years ago. We're having to deal with loan finance, housing management focus. We work in partnership with local authorities, with developers, with the housing finance agency. There's 13 of our members who are accredited with the housing finance agency being able to borrow money. And that enables an additional provision and better value for money of part government grant with loan finance that we borrow, that we pay back via state funding. And it enables development. We're also trying to actively work looking to, to the future to have alternatives to the Housing Finance Agency. We're trying to create a special purpose vehicle committee that would enable investment funding to come in that would fund the sector for the provision of new housing. We're actively, uh, Donald here is very active and the larger member associations are very actively working at that to see if we can avail possibly of credit union money to enable that kind of investment for us to access funding for the delivery of new housing. Um, one of the other things, and it's been... Uh, just to allude to it, I mean, as I said, we do provide a lot of our schemes, particularly in the rural areas, it's not an urban problem. A lot of the, and I'm looking here at Deputy from Clare, but in, like in County Clare, there are a lot of schemes for the elderly. Uh, they have been pioneered by people in local communities. We think it's a, a very vital contribution to Irish life, but what's really needed in the maintenance of those elderly schemes is some sort of assisted independent living funding. That would enable, when pe older people become less able, they need more assistance support, they don't need to go into nursing homes, there need to be a source of funding coming in to the housing body to enable them to live independently. We've called for that for 20 years and got nowhere with it, so we can make the case again. But we think it's a very important contribution of community life, particularly in rural areas. And it's something, to my mind, that's often unrecognised of what capital funding from the state has enabled over the last 20 years. Um, We'd welcome this, the idea of the cross-party committee. Uh, it's important in bringing the different stakeholders together. Uh, we think that it maybe should be something that would be ongoing and active, that would review the delivery by the different stakeholders of developers, of ourselves as approved housing bodies, and by the local authorities. And um, as I said, we've made particular recommendations in our report that you may want to clarify with us or seek further information on, and we'd happily engage with you on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the full report will go on the website uh, after the meeting, um, and I acknowledge the recommendations and so forth that were 
um, made in it. A number of deputies uh, have questions and comments for you. I'll step, start with Deputy Harty. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Justin and Donald and Karen, for coming. Um, as, as you're quite familiar, in our village we built uh, a, a unit of 16 houses f 15 years ago now. And we have taken in people who have been homeless. We have taken people out of nursing homes. We have housed people who were in very poor housing, rural housing. Um, and it has been a very successful scheme. We, we were perhaps lucky at the time in that the funding of that scheme was uh, the community raised 5% and 95% of the scheme was provided through, I think, the Department of the Environment. Does that system still work or is that funding still available? Because we've had people come to us from other villages looking at our scheme and wondering if they could replicate it in their own villages. Uh, Mr. Just, McManus. Um, just on that, on that chair, uh, it, it's true those schemes that uh, Deputy Hardy mentioned were well replicated throughout the country, and there was probably about 8,000 homes built for older people at that time. The scheme is still there, it's called the Capital Assistance Scheme. Now, it hasn't, it hasn't the scale of money it had, say, 10, 15 years ago. It's around 70 million now, and it was about 150 million 15 years ago. The scheme is there. It can be both 90% funded uh, by the state and 5% by yourself, or I c it can be 100% funded. If you take everybody off the waiting list, that's the, the quid pro quo on that. So it's still there. Obviously, for in many schemes, the draw on 70 million throughout the country would be would be very heavy. So for any big schemes, uh, it would have an impact. But the scheme is there. It's worked very well. Probably one of the most successful schemes uh, from the government's point of view over the last 30 years in its, in its simplicity. Uh, but it hasn't the scale of capital funding. Now, in that context, some, some associations are moving towards what Justin mentioned, this mixed funding regime, where you get 30% uh, capital contribution from the state and you borrow 70% finance. Now, it's only in that context where the association has equity and cash. Will they do that? For smaller local associations who may not have access to cash or able, able to borrow, they may, may not go down that route. So, uh, but in urban areas, some of the larger associations are looking at that uh, for older people. But the scheme is still there, but not, not on the same scale it was. 15, 20 years ago. The scheme that we uh, had, 75% of the people came from the housing list and we had a discretionary allocation of, of 25%. So if you were to have 100% of people coming off the housing list, you can have 90% of that scheme funded, is that right? You can have 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. And what's the mechanism of uh, applying for that? Well, again, it's uh, to the chair, it's uh, through the local authority again, so Clare County Council, say, in your respect, would uh, you contact the uh, local authority to see if, if there is a demand, obviously you draw on everyone from the witness and say West Clare, so you're, you have to reassure the local authority there is a demand, and then once the uh, local authority are happy with that, they would prioritise the list of schemes in Clare and submit it to the department for consideration. So, again, you have to go through the local authority uh, to approve the scheme. And if it is approved, then the department will indicate when money can be drawn down as a priority. You know, but uh... just one more supplementary. So you have to establish a need, and then you have to um, apply to the county council, and they will prioritise the scheme. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, recently, there's more. Uh, probably back to your time, Deputy uh, Hardy. There was more an open call, but now there's an annual call under the capital assistance scheme usually happens in the springtime, and it calls all associations to bring forward schemes that they have them uh, for assessment by the local authority to be prioritised with the department. Uh, so it goes to an annual basis now in the past. It was open all the time. You could apply throughout the year. But again, you have to go back uh, through the local authority system uh, for that and prove your need. And I think the key thing is now uh, is to make an impact on the local authority waiting list in the area, whether it's Clare or Cork or whatever. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Daly. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm going to sound negative, and I hate sounding negative, and I, I don't mean it personally or anything like this, but I actually don't get the role of housing bodies, right? And I'm not saying this in a smart way, right? But it could be viewed by people, uh, and I, I'm probably one of them who don't view it like this, is that a lot of the functions that you've taken on were functions that were traditionally those of the local authorities, and that a lot of what you've done is replicated the old model, but at a significantly added expense and in a duplicitous or duplicated manner in the sense of if you say there are 270 organisations providing 30,000 houses, 
I don't I know there's some very very small ones but that's an average of 110 units for each housing association and we had a discussion earlier about economies of scale and this is one I'd like to know how many of those associations what's the staff numbers the administrative staff in those associations how many of them have chief executives directors of finances how many of them have separate offices and so on and I'm not in any way saying it in a nasty way I think they're they're very valid uh, questions because, to be honest, years ago when we didn't really have them, except maybe for specialist uh, accommodation for people with disabilities or whatever, where you could see a certain role, generally the local authorities did this. And it smacks to me of, of middlemen, kind of. Now, I know the fiscal space and as a Moraya cod version of borrowing money, that there's some function of it, but, and I'm not saying I agree with that, but there's a certain logic in that. But beyond that, I honestly don't know why the local authorities aren't doing this function. That was their job, the provision of social housing. And I think we need a reorientation in that. I'm not saying that you don't do necessary work, but it's how it's been done, the manner in which, I mean, there was a, a not very funny joke about the uh, organisations that...